Michelle Obama now has a podcast, and the first guest was her husband, former President Barack Obama. And um, this is a, a little portion of the podcast that popped up on my Twitter timeline. <sighs> the stuff they say is just as smug, arrogant, elitist, and disconnected as you thought it would be. Watch this. The only thing that worries me, and I agree in terms of the hope that I feel when I look at young people, just how they were raised, the values, their exposure, the questions that they have, the change in the economy that's forcing them to ask a certain set of questions. That gives me hope. But the thing that I worry is that I hear, I think, too many young people who question whether voting, whether politics is worth it. Well, um, partly because they have been told the message is sent every day that government doesn't work you know they take for granted all the things that a working government has done in the past yeah. and in, in some ways we're still living mm -hmm. on the investment that was made by that greatest yeah. generation? I always joke that, you know, and I said this about, um, you know, one of the challenges of being president is like, you don't have a marketing budget, you yeah. know? There's really no structure to market government, right? right. I mean, the average young person knows far more about the cereal they're eating yes. and the car they're driving than they do about what government actually does for them because they don't have a marketing budget. The there isn't a time, jingle. You know? <laughs> the only time they know about what government's doing is, is when, when it's it not doesn't going. work. Right. So we're so, getting a good lesson in that right now. Exactly. If people are paying attention and they understand what's missing, right. not having a, you know, a public health system uh, that takes care of people, whether you're working or not, um, that takes care of you, whether you have pre-existing conditions or not, um, unemployment, um, Social Security, you know, all of the things that sort of keep people going when the chosen path doesn't work. And, um, and, and and I think you're absolutely right that the danger for this generation is that they become too deeply cynical in government. Why do you think we've become too deeply cynical? Why do you think that is, President Obama? That's a pretty straightforward question. Now, obviously, he can't answer it because he's not with me right now, but my guess is he would dodge because he wouldn't like the answer. So, I was born in 1988, which makes me the absolute perfect age to, you know, really have the peak of my political awakening during the Obama years. Um, born in 88, he was elected in 2008. I'm 20 years old. It was the first election that I could vote in. Um, and, of course, I went and I cast my vote for him. Now, I had seen a lot of my political development was from what happened directly before Obama in the Bush years. And I cannot overstate how terrible those years are. I mean, anybody who was paying attention and really cares about what's going on in the world was mortified during those years. We had multiple endless wars going on. We had... Uh, a giant economic crash, subprime mortgage crisis, and the Great Recession. And we had this child, who's basically the most powerful person in the world, doesn't even believe in science, backwards socially as well, anti-gay marriage and things of that nature. So, we experienced how bad it was, then along comes Barack Obama, and basically... My generation, many of you guys listening to the show, although we have people of all different ages, um, we said, you know what? This is our moment. This is our moment. Now it's time to change history. Now it's time to assert ourselves and basically support fundamental radical change. And a lot of people voted for Barack Obama hoping that he was going to be as transformative a figure as FDR was the generation prior. And in fact, in that 
they're back and forth there. What does Obama say? He says, quote, in some ways, we're still living on the investment made by the greatest generation. You know what he's referring to? He's referring to FDR and the New Deal. He's referring to um, the social programs that came into existence in prior generations. Whether it's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. You could also throw in Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty in there as well, which obviously came later. But he's saying... In many ways, we're still living on the investment made by the greatest generation. Right. But see, when we elected you, we were expecting another round, another wave of fundamental systemic change in that vein. And we didn't get it. So let's go through some of what they say here. Too many young people question if politics is worth it. I wonder why they question if politics is worth it. Now, the argument they make is, well, it's because they're... They're not really educated on what's going on. They know more about the cereal they're eating, and they know more about, you know, the different products and the commercials. They don't know about what's happening in government. I submit to you, this generation is the most educated generation, and the problem is the exact opposite. We know too much about what's going on, and we see how disgusting the whole system is and how disgusting everybody involved is, and that's what turns people off to politics. What turns people off to politics is that you have... A Republican Party and a diet Republican Party. So do you want to support neoconservative corporatists or neoliberal corporatists? Do you want uh, intervention like the neocon hawks support? So do you want hard intervention or soft intervention? This is the spectrum of debate. This is why young people are so turned off to politics, because the, the feeling is, well, if I'm always supporting the lesser of two evils, what's the point? I would like an option that's not evil. So it's so funny that he's complaining about this because he's part of the problem. And in fact, with him, he might be the worst part of the problem because we had such high hopes for him. And then when he comes in and he's just another politician and he governs just like Bill Clinton did in the 1990s, well, of course people are going to be turned off to this stuff. Michelle Obama actually has the nerve to say there, um, you know, well, y you don't have a marketing budget, so they don't really know the things that you've done for them. And, I mean, think about it. Like, now young people are realizing how terrible it is that we, like, have no public health system, for example. Your husband had a supermajority when he was president. A supermajority of Democrats. And you know what he did? He passed the Republican health care plan. The individual mandate plan originally came from the Heritage Foundation, which is a right-wing think tank. It was previously supported in the 1990s by Newt Gingrich and Chuck Grassley. It was the right-wing answer to the left-wing position of national health care. They wanted to keep the private system in control. Your husband passed the Republican health care plan. He's admitted it before. He's come out and said, I'm basically a moderate Republican of the 1980s. This is what Obama says. So you can't say, oh my God, these kids don't appreciate what government has done for them. And then you cite an example where the government didn't do anything for them. Certainly didn't do the right thing for them. You could say, yes, Obamacare was a step in the right direction above what we had before. But that doesn't mean it's good. What's good is at the very least a public option, but really the answer is Medicare for all. That's the only way you cover absolutely everybody. That's the only way. So, you know, I mean, even the examples they use disprove their point. And just the idea that like, well, pff, these young people, they're so caught up in all the consumerist nonsense. That's the problem. They really need to be educated on what government does. No, we are educated on what the government does, and that's why usually... Turnout among younger voters is down. Because they recognize it's all, you know, lesser of two evils and politicians are full of it. Barack Obama had a real opportunity to be a transformative figure and he just wasn't. Now, does that mean I'm not going to give him credit where he does good things like the Iran deal and, and, you know, moving towards peace with Cuba, for example? No, of course I'll give him credit where credit is due. But let's not pretend like, you know, his, president, his presidency represented what it could have represented, which is the next FDR and real fundamental systemic reform. He could have tried to do something to end the corruption. He did not. He didn't 
even end the wars. See, if he had, if all else was exactly the same and Obama ended the wars, I would probably be a giant Obama defender because that's such a big thing that you it can't be overlooked. It's not just like, oh, a little good thing here or there. No, that's like one of the primary reasons he was elected. I know because I'm one of the people who, who voted for him and that was one of my main reasons for voting for him. It's like, okay, at least we'll end these stupid wars. He didn't do it. And now he has the nerve to go out there and say th this stuff. Too many young people don't know if politics is worth it. Um, you know, the message is sent every day that government doesn't work. Well, yes, it does work. In some ways, we're still living on the investment made by the greatest generation. This is all the stuff they were saying. Um, Michelle says, you don't have a marketing budget. That's the problem. By the way, that's also a hilarious thing to say because, yeah, his marketing budget is himself. When you're a politician, you make your own case. What do you mean he doesn't have a marketing budget? His whole source of power comes from the fact that he's a convincing speaker. So he is his biggest marketer. That's the way it works in politics. That's the way it works. But the thing is, there's not really... The, the core stuff is not there for him to brag about because he didn't do it. He didn't get us Medicare for All or even a public option when he had a supermajority. He bailed out Wall Street, which is the exact opposite of what he should have done. I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm not going to go through everything here, but... I mean, guys... The Obamas are exactly what you think they are. The first story post his presidency, remember what it was with Barack Obama? It was him taking a tremendous amount of money for Wall Street speeches. I forget the exact amount, maybe 400 grand, a pop or something like that. The very first time he was in the news post his presidency was him getting paid, son. That's the very first time. You know what I think the second time was? He was parasailing with the creepy billionaire Richard Branson. Is that his name, Richard Branson? Virgin Airlines guy, kind of funky looking. He was hanging out with that guy, smiling on a boat. You know, you look at Obama and what he did, it's almost like he feels like, well, I was president, now I'm not president. It's almost like this above that disconnection from him where it's not, he doesn't really fully understand that you know, we still have millions of people in this country that don't have health care. We still have these wars going on and innocent civilians are dying all the time. Now we have a pandemic and 150,000 Americans are dead and more will be added. Like, there's all these real problems. He feels like, well, I just put my time in, now I'm done, so I'm gonna enjoy... I'm gonna enjoy the rest of my life. Like, I did... I paid my dues. So in a funny way, he's kind of guilty of the thing he accuses millennials of being guilty of and, and young folks. Of like, oh, they're so disconnected and they're so obsessed with consumerism and material goods. And it's like, that's kind of how you're acting now. As you browbeat everybody. And here's the worst part of it all. His solution is what? Just vote for more Democrats. Oh, just vote for more Democrats. So move some deck chairs around on the Titanic. That's what you want to do. Because if all we're doing is voting for neoliberal corporatists, then I got news for you. At some point, there's going to be a President Tucker Carlson. And perhaps President Tucker Carlson is going to be even more competent than Donald Trump is. And perhaps that has really devastating consequences. He refuses to acknowledge or accept the idea that in many ways, he fell short of what his promise was. And he also doesn't understand that... Yes, it is a direct result of the neoliberal corporate Democratic Party that leads to a rise in the fake populist far right. In his mind, the dynamic is as simple as Democrat good, Republican bad, so now I will browbeat young people to fall in line and vote for Democrats. You wouldn't have to browbeat them if you did Medicare for all and if you ended the wars. You wouldn't have to browbeat them if you did an infrastructure deal and upgraded our infrastructure from a grade of D-plus to a grade of A-plus. You wouldn't have to browbeat them if you raised wages, if you legalized marijuana and freed all the nonviolent drug offenders. You wouldn't have to browbeat us. We would just show up. Because the problem is the opposite of what you're saying. It's not like we're not educated enough on it. We're overeducated on it, and so we see that you're full of it too. The Democrats are full of it too. 
So, this is, unfortunately, this is exactly what you'd expect from Obama. And Michelle, how condescending is it for them to say, well, the reason why these young people don't know anything is because there's no jingle and no marketing budget to what we've done. They know more about their favorite cereal and stuff. <laughs> Oh, man, they really think that they're the saviors and their hands are clean in all this. And they really think the Democrats are the answer. Full stop. We had eight years of Democratic leadership, and that led to Donald Trump getting elected. You would think that would make you look in the mirror a little bit, but clearly it hasn't.